A few years ago when I was with News Laundry, we were doing an edit meeting. Someone gave an idea for a story. I was like, hey, that's a nice idea. It would make for great content. One of our editors interrupted me and said, Meghnad, call it a report or a story. Don't call it content. I was a little surprised. Not with the editor, he was right in his own way. I was surprised with my own response. Why did I just casually throw this word content around? Did this mean that I had unconsciously started to look at everything on the internet as content? These are some of the questions that I have been struggling with. What is content? When Dhruv Rathi covers the wrestlers protest, is that content or is he doing journalism? When Abhi and Niu give people details about the Chandrayaan 3, is that content or journalism? When I was doing Sunset Watch for News Laundry, was I just creating content or was I also doing journalism? Was I reporting? Was I doing a story? When Arnab does his nightly screeching matches, is he reporting the news or is he just creating content? You see, the reason why I've been struggling with this is because the lines between content and journalism have blurred massively, especially because of YouTube and its blasted algorithm. When I did Sunset Watch, there was a conscious and active effort to make it more entertaining, to make it most interesting so that the audience doesn't get bored and drop off. I did some strategic gimmicks at particular points in the video because the data told us that the audience will drop off at the four and a half minute mark. Whether I like it or not, I was competing for space on YouTube with stuff like this. हमारे होने वाले हैं आज 22 मिलियन सब्सक्राइबर्स सिर्फ 300 सब्सक्राइबर रह गए हाउ इन द वर्ल्ड एम आई सपोज टू कंपीट विद दैट एंड गेट यू इंटरेस्टेड इन बोरिंग एस पार्लियामेंट व्हेन सीरियसली हाउ हाउ सो आई हैव गिवन अप थिंकिंग अबाउट दिस आई एम क्रिएटिंग कंटेंट नाउ व्हाट यू आर वाचिंग राइट नाउ इज कंटेंट आई सॉ द डेटा ऑन द लास्ट वीडियो द 48 minute long one and I know that 40% of you would stay till the 5 minute mark and then just go away. I know that only 10% of you will actually watch the video till the end which means 9 out of 10 people who have clicked on this video will just go away. As of recording this I know that a little more than 5,000 people have made it to the end of my first video in this series. My brain is now geared towards making this video more interesting, more compelling. I have started thinking like a content creator. And you know who understands this better than I do? Ranveer freaking Alabadia. What are, what are those episodes like when you're talking about like aliens or whatever supernatural? Like how do you get in that zone where you're... Are you genuinely that curious about all this stuff or it's just like, I've, I know the audience likes it, so I have to do it and this yeah, is what it I've is. I've always been curious about these things since I was a kid. I'm just getting a chance to express myself now. Hmm. So that's why it's coming out this much and it's great for the subscribers and views. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very aware of that, bro. Yeah. Nothing that comes out of my mouth is not for views or subscribers. Like I am very focused on growing. Like, uh, like, and I'll do anything to grow. Yeah, he gets it. And he has been super successful at it too. He honestly doesn't give a rat's ass about what content he's putting out unless it's amusing, entertaining content that would grow his subscribers. When I decided to do this Ranveer Does Fluffoganda series, I was acutely aware that if I have to make my own content more compelling, then I have to do what he does. But there is a difference. I do research, I write a script, I give you sources wherever required, and then I try to make this shit entertaining. Pierre Bicep skips all the steps in the beginning and just focuses on the last one, entertainment, which explains why his channel has stuff like this. I've once dated someone only two, three months into dating. She told me that she's also an empath. I was telling her about my relationship with my father and then she just held my hand really tightly, squeezed it and then she started crying. I'm like, what is happening here? She's like, your father is in a lot of pain and then he's in this place. Something going on. I got really scared. I started chanting Hanuman Chalisa in my head. Okay. There was this girl I liked 
liked a lot in school. In front of me, there was a geometry box. So I took the divider. And I said, hey, let's let's call that girl Pooja. <laughs> hey, Pooja, <laughs> look here. <laughs> and then I scratched out her first uh, name ka first letter on my tricep. Are you entertained? If you're still here, you'd be happy to know that 60% of the audience watching this video has probably dropped off before being entertained by Ranveer Alabadia just now. They probably got distracted by a motivational reel. Ranveer sir, he is everywhere. You cannot escape his vacant, empty looks. The big question we need to ask is, should ministers of the current government sit down with an entertainer and can we expect anything good to come of it? Who am I kidding? Who the fuck am I kidding? Kya Hamare Pradhan Mantri Aam Khate? Remember that? Yeah, Ranveer is doing like a mini version of that glorious entertainment content package that was fed to us and delivered to us before the 2019 election. Anyway, doesn't matter what I think, Ranveer sir is a content creator who got access to ministers of the Modi government to do what he does best, entertain. Today, we are going to look at one such piece of content that he put out. Why are you doing this podcast? You know, I'm doing this podcast, one, because I like you. Huh? Uh, I, but two, uh, I'm also doing it because I feel today you need to, to get people to understand what, what we are about, what the government's about, what the world is about. Yes, my dear 30% leftover audience, we are going to look at Beer Biceps' interview with our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Subramanyam Jai Shankar. Dr. Subramanyam Jai Shankar. In case this is the first video you are watching on my channel, welcome, welcome to my channel called Make Nerd. This is a part two of the Ranveer Does Fluffoganda series. There is also a part one where I dissected Ranveer's Piyush Goyal interview and used it as an excuse to talk about politics, who is Goyal, and even do some poetry reading. Fluff, fluff, fluffoganda. It's so fun. It's so bright. Sweet as candy but it's not right. You might want to check that out too. On the same lines, today, Dr. S. Jay Shankar and Beer Biceps have given us the wonderful opportunity to dive into the fascinating world of geopolitics and foreign affairs. But before we start, a disclaimer. I straight up took this disclaimer from Ranveer's TRS show. It says, our guests always make statements in good faith and we upload videos in good faith. Our guest comments are for informational purposes only and we take no responsibility for their accuracy, validity or completeness. Ranveer is telling us that his guests give information but they don't take responsibility for whether it is accurate, complete or even valid. It's just there like mucus under your chair or a blob of rotting dahi chutney on the street like an abandoned crooked park bench that you cross every day on your way to work. It just exists. Whether it's useful to you or not is also not something Ranveer cares about, okay? To form your own opinions and judgments, viewers should always conduct their own due diligence while interpreting any information derived from this video. Cool! Thanks for the tip, Ranveer. We are going to do that right now. We are going to rip apart your videos and do some due diligence on them. Just rip, rip, rip. It's important to remember that we don't want to create rumors, offend any religion, community or individual or disrespect any living or dead persons. Oh, you don't want to create rumors? Really, Ranveer? 
so nice of you you are such a responsible person i mean so nice of you traditionally this was called edutainment educational yeah. enter- entertainment and edutainment also has gone into the gaming yeah so you can you can make games i i i used to make games i way back oh, wow. uh, as a programmer so i know all this gaming stuff uh, i i'm deep into this uh, the ethos of gaming for good purposes wow so you can you can you can create you can make game i even have a, a book coming out i will reveal a little bit where i'm describing the cosmos as a game oh oh my god <laughs> and, and, and this is a vedic view by the way the cosmos is a game wow <sighs> Yeah. Let's talk about Ranveer and his friends a little bit, shall we? The whole reason why this disclaimer exists. So, before I get to the actual interview with our foreign affairs minister, I wanted to give you some background on what sort of information, not rumors, information Ranveer has been exposing himself in the arena of geopolitics i especially want to take a look at them because in the interview with the minister ranveer mentions these names and says that the information on the subject comes from these people it was just a 45 minute conversation and i know that the next time i meet him it's going to be a 2 hour conversation we're going to go much deeper we're going to cover many more topics i'm going to ask him a lot more questions that Abhijit Chawda, Rajiv Malhotra, Abhijit Iyer Mitra have raised in my mind, but that's for the next time. Okay, let's do this. Can't turn on the fan. Sweating like crazy because it rains in Delhi and then it's still hot. What is this? What is Delhi even? My head is shiny. Wake up, Dada. Wake up, Dada. Then Friend number 1, Rajiv Malhotra. Rajiv Malhotra is a 72-year-old Indian-born American citizen. He studied physics and computer science and then went on to establish something called the Infinity Foundation. It's a registered not-for-profit organization in Princeton, US of A. This foundation specializes in the field of civilizational studies applying the dharma lens to examine a broad range of topics applying the dharma lens what i'll just let vimo explain this one what rajiv balotra means when he says dharma lens is an indian perspective what he means by it is that when we look at society and we come to value judgments about what is right and what is wrong we often define things on the basis of a western sentiment individualism is given preference over Uh, social well-being and stuff like that so what he means by dharma lens is that when we look at reality when we look at society when we look at people's interactions with each other sure one way of looking at it is the western perspective but what he means by dharma lens is when you look at these things from the indic perspective unfortunately what he means by the indic perspective is slightly more problematic he means a very vedic perspective India is a multicultural nation and if there is something called the Indian lens then that lens will have the colors of every religion that exists in India every perspective that comes from India to reduce India to only the vedic way of looking at things is problematic and that is Rajiv Malhotra's definition of the dharma lens do check out my youtube friend vimo's channel Link is in the description below. He does all sorts of interpretations which are very fun. Anyway, I wanted to find out more about this person. So I went to the Infinity Foundation website, found his about page, and here's what it says. Rajiv Malhotra was trained initially as a physicist and then as a computer scientist specializing in AI in the 1970s. You will look at this and go, "Oh, this man did AI 50 years ago?" before it was cool chat gpt and all to came now only but rajiv sir was an expert in ai 50 years ago here's the funny thing if you go on web.archive to check what this page said on may 12th 2020 3 years ago it's 
डिफरेंट इन मे ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी राजीव मल्होत्रा वॉज अ रिसर्चर ऑथर स्पीकर थिंकर एंड अ पब्लिक इंटेलेक्चुअल ऑन कंटेम्प्ररी इश्यूज एज दे रिलेट टू सिविलाइजेशन क्रॉस कल्चरल एनकाउंटर स्पिरिचुअलिटी एंड साइंस सो वेन डिट दिस ए आई स्पेशलाइजेशन लाइन गेट एडेड जून ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी नोप ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी नोप सप्टेंबर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी नोवेंबर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी Bingo. So, somewhere between September 2020 and November 2020, Rajiv Sir decided that he needs to tell the world that he has specialized in artificial intelligence. Before that, he was just a researcher, author, thinker, वगैरह वगैरह. Now he has suddenly become an expert in AI. It seems. You know what happened between September 2020 and November 2020? You don't. Let me tell you. OpenAI gave Microsoft exclusive access to its GPT-3 language model. This is considered one of the significant events in the recent past regarding AI development. GPT-3 was launched by OpenAI in June 2020. But when Microsoft made this announcement, it caught the attention of literally everyone. Microsoft has thrown about 13 billion dollars at OpenAI till now. So you can imagine why this partnership announcement was big rajiv sir is a clever clever man he saw this and the potential of telling people that he's an ai expert and with just one quick change on his website bio just like that he became one recently rajiv malhotra was appointed as the honorary lecturer in the center for media studies at the jawaharlal nehru university in a clip that went viral Rajiv Malhotra was seen with rape accused Nityanand Swami. This is the same guy who ran away from India, bought an island near Ecuador somewhere and calls himself Jagat Guru Mahasanidhanam, Supreme Pontiff of Hinduism, Bhagwan Nityanand Param Shivam. This is worse than Gurmeet Ram Rahim Singh ji insan. It's longer. In this clip, Malhotra advises billionaires around the world to invest in something called interlife reincarnation trust management. This would let them trace their own souls in the afterlife, like a GPS map location, and then when they are reborn, because Hinduism rebirth, you know. So when they are reborn, they can transfer their wealth to their own soul. in the new life with the new body and for this amazing service rajiv sir will charge us tiny tiny commission of 25% more like a service fee so cheap yeah this is real yes it is i can't show it to you because these morons are on the internet all day long sending copyright strikes but it is real if you want to actually see this go to this video you will find a very helpful comment telling you where it starts now this guy rajiv malhotra goes on beer biceps podcast because this time he is an expert in what uh, what was it what what is in what is he an expert in now rajiv malhotra is a renowned computer scientist who spent the last 50 years in the usa studying artificial intelligence computer science geopolitics as well as ancient indian scriptures at this point in time we need a geopolitics expert to shed light on this subject that's why rajiv malhotra has been brought on on trs that's right he's a geopolitics expert ranveer asked some very important questions to him how are you looking at the world could you explain it a little deeper keeping modern day geopolitics in mind because we talk a lot about i mean at least the youth talks a lot about world war 3 that how it's going to be based on cyber warfare how it's already begun how the pandemic is probably a version of world war 3 so sir when this whole pandemic broke out you know when december 2019 was happening what was in your head considering the fact that you had already i'm guessing you had already learned a lot by that point so maybe you anticipated it maybe you know what's coming what do you think is happening in the world right now sir in ranveer's geopolitics podcast you will find that he is obsessed with world war 3 and he thinks that the youth is also talking about this all the time so it's natural that when the pandemic happened the youth started asking oh is this world war 3 rajiv gave some answers so i think that uh, if you look at the cosmology 
uh, the, the, the whole cosmic game, uh, you know, in that Bharat has a very special role. In a, I'm looking at uh, from our lens, but Bharat has not honored that role. It is not performing that role. It is not capable of performing that role. It is very highly polluted, corrupted from bottom to top. We can talk about it. I'm very disillusioned with the caliber uh, you know, of, of Indian institutions, Indian, whether it is this government or old government. Uh, generally, generally the, the, what you expect of a tradition, which is the Rashtra that is supposed to lead the world forward, the Vishwa Guru, the world is not being led by uh, Bharat Vishwa Guru at all. So that is one thing you have to put aside. You cannot look at the world and say, okay, we are Vishwa Guru. That is how we look at geopolitics. Not the case. It ought to be the case, but what ought to be is not necessarily what is. Okay, so according to this fellow who believes in GPS mapping dead souls, India is supposed to be great because of some cosmic reason, but it's just not happening, yaar. What yaar, we are supposed to be Vishwaguru, but it's just not happening, yaar. So if you look at it in a very pragmatic way, India is in trouble. Forget being Vishwaguru, India is in trouble for its own existence. And, and this is where the, the revolution of artificial intelligence is going to push it forward faster. Uh, the, the, you know, India was sort of hodgepodge, we are doing very well, then we take a step back, then we take a step forward. Oh, of, oh, oh, wait, yeah, of course, he's an AI expert now, so obviously that will also come in somehow. As Rajiv was saying, we are supposed to be a Vishwaguru because the cosmic stars and astrology and his belief system says so. But damn it, there are so many things that are just not letting it happen. Bear Biceps just laps it all up and uh, asks more amazing questions on geopolitics. Uh, you know, again, the beautiful thing is, yes, our education system is highly criticized, but we're still smart people. And now we're starting to learn from the internet, hopefully from podcasts like this one. So, so could you elaborate a little more on what could possibly go wrong from what you said? I understood that you mean a fragmentation of India will take place where the country might get divided into more countries or, you know, pieces of the country will be taken away and absorbed into other countries. And that's honestly something that a lot of people need to wrap their brains around. Wait, what? What? E he suddenly become tukde tukde gang leader Kanhaiya Kumar now. What did he just? Never mind. Go on. So while I have a zillion questions after every single answer of yours, I'm trying to curate this as an introduction piece to you because I'm sure you'll be back on the show. Uh, therefore, let's talk about something that's relevant. Uh, we had someone called Mr. Abhijit Chavda on the show. I believe even you know him and you guys have interacted uh, in the recent past as well. He is also very fascinated and uh, into geopolitics in general. And he keeps bringing up this concept about COVID being a man-made virus. So the obvious question, again, this is because you study geopolitics in such a wide way. And I'm sure you've also delved a little bit into bioweapons in your studies. I'd love to know about biological warfare in general, the future of it. The obvious question is also... The coronavirus, is it man-made? Is it being deployed in order to pull up China's GDP while the rest of the world's GDP is kind of plateauing? Abhijit Chawda. Yes, we'll get to him. But wait, Rajiv sir is now a biologist. M microbiologist? A gene mapper? Uh, bio may change karna padega, maybe. 50 years ago, he was a gene mapper, I guess. I don't know. Whatever he is, he is an expert, okay? Just take it and go. So, I think this was probably a technology being developed. It had not been finalized. It had probably not reached the stage where uh, President Z pushed the button and said, okay, now go with it. It was sort of happening when it accidentally leaked out. I think that's probably the case. So, it was kind of a semi-finished, incomplete kind of a virus job are not truly perfected to do what it, uh, what it could do even more dangerously. And it somehow leaked out and then it's gone. Uh, I feel that that's a scenario. I don't have any proof for it, but I have a lot of uh, uh, information. Here's a tip. If you don't have any proof, then don't say it. It's really simple. Not saying things. It's very simple. He goes on and on and on like this in multiple podcasts. There is so much nuttiness here, just 
I I can't I can't but uh, Rajiv is just one character in the beer biceps universe there are others like this guy most modern day news media is biased is possibly bought out is possibly not pure which is why today's podcast should reach international audiences abhijit chavda is on the show again he's a scientist he's a historian but for me my favorite version of him is when he becomes a geopolitics expert friend number 2 abhijit chawda abhijit chawda becomes a geopolitics expert for ranveer alabadia because that's what you can do on this podcast become an expert in whatever you want who is he though abhijit chawda is primarily a youtuber with about 600k followers on his channel he offers insights into geopolitics contemporary world affairs and history from an indian perspective not dharmic perspective indian perspective it further claims that his unique research backed world view has made him one of the strongest voices in the indian digital space he is no small guy he has also represented india at international forums including the g20 summit on his instagram there is a photo of him at the inception meeting of science 20 track of 2023 g20 proceedings at puducherry and he met someone who you must be very familiar with by now if you aren't go watch part 1 of this series to get familiar guys oh my god guys 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 it's all linked it's it's all related they all know each other it's it's all linked all all of it it's just like this big web of of people who are just just bahut mehnat karta hu main pasina aa raha hai on his website chawda writes that he is a theoretical physicist technologist and writer he also sells a course for 1500 bucks titled bharat a biography of the oldest civilization here is a fun little review of the course left by someone called vm this man's memory science history geopolitics is just amazing i recommend every one of his viewers to take this course best course to start decolonization of mind hats off to you guru ji suggestion to abhijit ji please bring at least few of the above original researchers on your channel in future rajiv malotra breaking india specialist in all perspectives combination of your and their work in itself will bring a tsunami in liberandos tsunami in liberandos i told you it's all connected this is the beer biceps universe it's a web of people who recommend each other and feed off each other and share audiences anyway chawda claims to be a theoretical physicist i try to find out what his qualifications are but that's a little bit murky his linkedin has zero information one shady source says that he has a masters in mechanical engineering from coimbatore institute of technology in the same shady source it says that he's the director of Eco Science Private Limited, which made me go, "Ooh, what's this now?" That name led me to Zauba Corp information, which lists Abhijit Himmat Bhai Chawda as a director, and it also led me to another LinkedIn profile of a very young, different-looking chap. In this profile, it says that Abhijit is the director of Eco Science Private Limited, has a mechanical engineering degree from CIT, and something called. LCIT that's Lakhim Chand Institute of Technology in all of this i did not find any physics maybe it was a part of his masters since he was doing mechanical engineering but definitely nothing degree wise which turned him into a theoretical physicist maybe young abhijit forgot to update his linkedin maybe old abhijit forgot to do that as well let's not degree shame him okay but I found another bio on a website called Sangam Talks. This is a website that hosts a bunch of conversations on 
Hinduism, Varna system, something called Kafirhood, Hindu unit. You know where this is going, right? Anyway, on this page, it says Abhijit's work in theoretical physics involves research on the topics of dark matter, dark energy, black hole physics, quantum gravity, and physical cosmology. He has authored and co authored several research papers on these topics. Ooh, papers! Let's, let's look at those then! There is this nerdy social media website called researchgate.net. It's a place for researchers to go publish their papers and connect with other researchers. It's like a LinkedIn but for nerdy scientist type people. This website has been criticized multiple times for being lenient towards ghost journals and not having proper publishing standards. In this, Abhijit has a profile with 11 publications. The first one was in August 2003 and the latest one is in July 2019. But one peculiar thing about all these publications is the second name that pops up with him. Lakhdeer Ji Chowda. Lakhdeer Ji Chowda. Lakhdeer Ji Chowda. Who is this? Dad? Uncle? Distant relative? Hmm. Interesting. Let's go there then. Lakhdeer Ji is the honorary director of Chowda Research Institute based in Surat. It has this logo. A swallow does a summer make. Okay then. This institute has no website, no presence other than in the bio of Lakhdeer Ji. But Lakhdeer Ji himself claims that, quote, he has six top of the planet contributions in the following areas of theoretical physics. Lakhdeer ji has done a PhD in theoretical particle physics from Purdue University. In June 2002, Lakhdeer ji and Abhijit published a paper in the British journal Classical and Quantum Gravity. That is the only peer-reviewed journal entry I have found till now. So. By attaching his name to an actual theoretical physicist who runs a non-existent research institute, did Abhijit Chowda pull a fast one on the world? It's a question I'm asking. I'm not making any allegations. It's just a question. I just found things, okay? And I'm just letting you know. In any case, all of this that I just told you about Abhijit Chowda has nothing to do with geopolitics. I don't want to degree shame him. He might have gained an interest in physics and did some work on it in his life. He might be a self-proclaimed theoretical physicist as a result. But where does geopolitics come in? And how is this expert saying stuff like this when he goes on TRS? Now, in the 1920s, 30s, etc., the UK was waning. The British Empire was declining. It was in gradual decline. And after World War II, what happened is that the, em the empire continued, but the headquarters moved westwards from London, UK to Washington, DC. Mm. It's the Anglo-Saxon Empire. Mm. It's the same entity. All of the structures are still in place, but now it's, it's dominated from Washington, DC. And the Illuminati. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. That's a whole different thing, yeah. Are you familiar with the Freemasons thing? Yes, of course. Would you like to enlighten the listeners who are just curious about this whole Illuminati angle and free, Freemasons? Right. So um, the Freemasons are supposed to be, they are known to be a, a secret society of sorts. Yeah. They're not very secret nowadays, but mm. uh, there is some aspect of the Freemasons that is like open to all. And it... It is alleged that they hold the reins of power in Europe and across the world. Mm. And they have chapters across the world, including in India. Mm. So if we talk about World War Three, there are several potential scenarios. If the US pushes too hard against Russia in Ukraine, they may provoke Russia into doing If they corner Russia too far, if they leave them with no recourse, then something may happen there. Mm. And when, when, when we're talking about World War Three, we're always talking nuclear, obviously. I mean, the Russians are not crazy. Mr. Putin is not a crazy person. He's not a madman like he's portrayed. He's a very rational person. He has governed his nation very rationally the past two decades. But if you push him too far into the corner, if you poke the bear too hard, something may happen. And that's what they achieved by starting the war in Ukraine. It was not the Russians who actually started it. The Americans pushed them, pushed them, pushed them, pushed them. And eventually the Russians had to fire the first shot. Okay. So the invasion of Crimea was just what, a peace mission done by a very rational Putin? His invasion of Ukraine recently by claiming that the country is full of Nazis is a 
बर्थडे पार्टी ही इज थ्रोइंग आलू पुटिन का नाम लिया तो मजा आ गया उसको इफ आई स्टार्ट गिविंग यू मोर एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ द काइंड ऑफ अमेजिंग बुलशेट दैट अभिजीत स्प्यूज आउट वी विल बी हियर ऑल डे आई गिव यू अ स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट इन टू दिस रेबिट होल नाउ गो हैव फन योर सेल्फ और डोंट एक्चुअली डोंट बिकॉज यू विल गेट ब्रेन डैमेज लाइक मी आई एम करंटली ब्रोकन आई एम स्वेटी आई एम ब्रोकन माई ब्रेन हैज टर्न इन टू मश I spent a week writing this segment. I see these people in my dreams. I can't sleep. What is happening? Yeah, you needed this, didn't you? Because after this, I'm going to assault you with some beer biceps, uh, beer biceps, tequila triceps. I mean, did you really think that this video was just about Ranveer? I mean, it's it's going to go to all sorts of unimaginable places. Yeah. Oh, don't forget to do 1.5x here. He, कौन से साइड में आता है? जो भी साइड में आता है. 1.5 x you know or or use the chapter time codes in the description to just fast forward in this video because it's a long one and i don't know you might want to watch instagram reels later okay it's time for chapter 2 chapter 2 chapter 2 kitna baki chapter 2 chapter 2 chapter 2 coming up right at you Ranveer Alabadia the geopolitics fanatic gets his information from people like Rajiv Malhotra and Abhijit Chawda and then armed with all that knowledge he goes on to talk to our foreign affairs minister Dr S Jay Shankar he just casually throws around the word geopolitics you know wherever it fits because SEO baby content and entertainment and keywords but what exactly is geopolitics let me give you a quick crash course on what it is in simple words geopolitics is the study of effects of the geography on politics and international relation if you look at how geography and physical terrain affects a country and its people how it affects the politics of the countries then that is geopolitics for instance india is surrounded by oceans on three sides and up north we have the himalayas which means we can do a lot of trade via sea with the rest of the world other sea based trade routes from the western world to the eastern world and vice versa also pass through the oceans around us which means geopolitically speaking we are in a pretty good place but then our land borders are shared with hostile countries like pakistan and china the himalayas might have been a natural barrier in the past up north but now it's becoming more and more porous as china starts building infrastructure up there pakistan of course is our sworn enemy 
a country that really wants a piece of Kashmir. But we aren't going to let them have that. So China and Pakistan find common ground every once in a while and team up to screw with us every now and then. All of this means that every year India has to spend a shit ton of money on building up an army and buying weapons. For a developing country like ours, our resources should ideally go towards building up businesses, our economy, feeding people ration, getting people out of poverty and stuff like that. Instead, we are left with trying to buy weapons, building up an army and defending ourselves pretty much all the time and that is expensive. Geopolitically speaking, that sucks balls. Oh, speaking of spending money on weapons, we have two options. Either we make our own, yeah, that hasn't really been going well. Or we buy weapons from other countries who make them as well. Which countries you ask? Uh, there is France, who our other near prime minister keeps making trips to. He's not just going there to do fun stuff with Emmanuel Macron, okay? He's not. He's going there to buy weapons for us. There's also the United States of America, which makes a bunch of weapons regularly to spread their version of freedom across the world. You know, spreading democracy and all, USA is very good at that. There's also Russia with a very rational ruler called Vladimir Putin. They gave us weapons too, but Russia has invaded Ukraine, which is siding with the NATO, which is full of Western countries like USA, Germany and France. So if we do too much weapon buying from Russia, they'll be pissed off. China is perpetually pissed off anyway. So what if Russia, China and Pakistan gang up on us and attack the top part of our country, which is now porous? What are we supposed to do then? Oh my God, we are fucked, aren't we? Yeah, that's, that's geopolitics. That's geopolitics. You see, it goes to all sorts of places and involves watching what countries around the world are doing and how politics is happening between them. It's about power play happening at the level of entire countries. It's a fascinating area of study, don't get me wrong, and it can involve a lot of theorizing. It's an interdisciplinary field which draws on knowledge from political science, geography, history, economics, and conflict studies. It is used for international relations, diplomacy, strategic studies, and even planning military strategy. I genuinely understand why Ranveer is so fascinated by this because once you start looking at patterns about how entire countries are behaving and what moves they are making to be more powerful and one up each other, it seems like a game of chess. Great. I'll just let Abhijit Chowda tell you. Why am I even bothering? Very quickly, sir, explain why you don't follow national politics and why do you instead follow geopolitics? See, there's politics at all levels in the world. In your family, there is politics. In your building apartment complex, there is politics. At the municipal level, at the district level, at the state level, at the national level, you have politics at various scales. I am not interested in petty politics. It just, just doesn't interest me. I am interested in the, the competition for the biggest prize in the world which is geopolitics and geostrategy. That is what interests me. I, I am a big picture guy. That's what I've always been. So that's what I look for. That's what excites me and interests me. Uh, these local elections and politics and all that really doesn't hold much water mm. for me. Yeah. Um, again, for me, again, the reason is just interest. I'm not at, I've never been interested in national politics. The moment I had my first geopolitical conversation, coincidentally with you, I was like, okay, this is my new subject. Here's the thing about big picture politics. There's a lot happening all the time. For instance, let's say there is a situation where one superpower is invading another country to steal their territory. Countries around the world are taking one side or the other, forming alliances, and looks like shit is about to go down. And then, a pandemic happens where a deadly virus starts spreading around the world, killing massive amounts of people. Then, a theory is floated that this virus actually might have leaked out of a lab. When you reach this point in your reasoning as a rational person, you will go read up on the Crimea annexation. You will then read up about COVID-19, then some stuff about the lab leak theory. 
a lot has been written on it and maybe come to a conclusion that there is a lot of grey area here. Maybe it was not a lab leak from China. Maybe it was. Can I say this definitively? No, I can't wait for more proof. That is the logical thing to do. Oh, but Ranveer's guess just take it and go ahead with it and run with it. Obviously. So geopolitics is about a lot of interpretation and theorizing. Tiniest of events can change the course of entire countries, affect the moods of people in power and make them do bizarre shit. If you take this rational approach where you as a consumer of these patterns, as an observer of these patterns, admits that things are basically random sometimes and that you shouldn't go nuts with theorizing and pattern formation unless you have actual proof. Then by all means, talk to me about geopolitics all you want. But the moment it enters conspiracy theory territory, you really need to hold back and think a little calmly. So Ranveer got this amazing opportunity to talk to our foreign minister to have a rational conversation about geopolitics, about India's foreign affairs and international relations. But he does this. Thank you, sir. Means a lot. Looking forward to talking to you again. If I may uh, be able to do so, I would like to fist bump okay. you and say thank you, sir. Thank you. Learning from thank you, you every day. Ranveer wants to make content. He fucking just wants to make content. That's that's all he wants. Entertainment. Co content. Content banao. Bas, bas, aise. Factory chalao. Content. Okay, let's talk about Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar a little bit, shall we? Dr. Jayashankar was born in Delhi. His father, K. Subramaniam, was a prominent civil servant, journalist and strategic affairs analyst. Subramaniam was appointed the convener of India's first National Security Council Advisory Board, which was established by the Atal Bihari Vajpayee government in 1998. The board drafted India's draft nuclear doctrine, which governs all policy aspects about usage and deployment of India's nuclear arsenal. In 2005, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh appointed K. Subramaniam to head a special government task force to study global strategic development. Suffice to say, S. Jayashankar's father had big time influence within the government. BJP or Congress, doesn't matter, just government. Moving on to his son. All things aside, S. Jayashankar has an impressive track record. He did his master's in political science, MPhil and PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Then he went on to serve as a diplomat in Moscow, Colombo, Budapest and Tokyo. After that, he was an ambassador to USA, China and Czech Republic. He was also briefly the president of global corporate affairs at Tata Sons Private Limited. Dr. Jayashankar has been the Indian external affairs minister since 2019 and has been awarded the Padma Shri in the same year. Kafi impressive. Plus, given his exposure to all of these countries and the exposure that he got from his father who was very accomplished, he does make a good external affairs minister for us. He would also be a great person to have for a podcast and discuss geopolitics, foreign affairs and India's strategic position in the world. Oh, and since he is an actual minister, maybe he would be the best person to tell us more about what the hell is going on with China. And guess what? Ranveer got very close to asking him that. Um, would you like to give the youth and especially entrepreneurs, any other geopolitical advice. When it comes to this, I don't want to use the phrase India versus China, but this whole scenario, how can we help? No, I look, I think you're smart not using that phrase India versus, <laughs> India versus China for this reason. Uh, yes, we have issues with China, but that's not the only issue. Ooh, so close. So close. Why won't you use India versus China, Ranveer? Is it because the questions that you are asking are pre-approved and you went a bit, a bit out of syllabus, a bit off script there just to wing it and uh, create content? Or is it because you assume that your audience is too stupid to understand nuance and take in uncomfortable information that does not agree with their worldview? Or were you afraid of upsetting the minister? and you losing access to the government. You know, 
it would be nice if you were able to ask our external affairs minister why we are not talking about china building expanded roads outpost weather proof camps with parking areas solar panels and helipads in aksai chen is that out of syllabus too is that not geopolitics ranveer tell me is it too much to expect a response from the very smart dr s jay shankar who is a uh, the owner of your life but always open to your thoughts dr jay shankar owner of my life that's Thank all you. i will say thank you for everything you're doing see it's the same behavior we saw in the last interview with piyush goel ranveer is doing bhakti he is doing fluffaganda and he is doing this again what is it with you and fist bump sir is it because the youth is watching your very interesting content So, is this interview fluffaganda? Yes. Was there a general lack of tough questioning on the part of Ranveer? Yes. But do you get anything insightful from this interaction at all? Also, yes. Look, I'm not sitting here to diss Dr. Jay Shankar because I don't agree with his party or government or I have problems with things that they do in general. I approached this interview hoping to learn something new. It's a 40-minute interview and I must say not all of it is bad. If you ignore Ranveer's presence in general, his servile attitude and his shallow questioning or just lack of questioning completely, Dr. Jay Shankar gave some very interesting insight during the podcast like this part about ai and why we should pay attention sure. you ask me do i watch patterns okay sure i watch patterns that's how i do my business that's why i think i can be good at my business now just imagine i am humanly because i have limited capabilities as a human being i'm watching the patterns of 200 people who i deal with every day imagine if i could process the patterns of 200 million people we are a, like a walking emitter of electronic patterns okay you know what you download what you say what you listen to what you buy what you eat today that pattern is organized it has actually become a business it has become politics it has become strategy it is actually at the end of the day this this uh, how do you uh, m- sort of mega process patterns and that then gives you a fantastic edge okay pause this should also bring up some questions about surveillance if an ai can recognize patterns of 200 million people instead of 200 then government gets intense surveillance powers over the population instead of having one person monitoring 200 citizens an ai can monitor 200 million at the same time and give reports to government about who is being naughty 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 citizen artificial intelligence in government is a double edged sword it will help us make better targeted policies yes but it will also help the government target us very precisely to affect our behaviors just like social media algorithms do right now but expecting ranveer to talk about the pitfalls of ai is expecting too much i guess his head is filled with stuff that self declared ai expert rajiv malhotra has filled in his head anyway so let's not expect ranveer to be smart about this at all so maybe the way we should build out artificial intelligence as humans is we should develop an ai based assistant for you <laughs> for you to be able to you know yeah, that's don't worry it'll happen <laughs> or is it already happening you never know okay Yes now we are talking that's a classic ranveer content creation attempt right there by the way why would we not know ranveer if our foreign affairs minister is using an ai assistant to help him to his job then we really need to know about it anyway let's not stress out ranveer too much in another part dr jay shankar also mentions the ongoing semiconductor shortage right now actually if you ask me what's right on our plate it's much more semiconductors you know there's this whole chip war uh, which is going on you can say a tech war which is going on uh, so a lot of what we are doing today is about that uh, and uh, uh, it's about uh, how do you actually prepare uh, for an era where you know uh, sort of chips you can say is the new oil mm. hmm? ranveer didn't go there but the minister did 
it was good of him to highlight that and it's good to know that the government is thinking about it if you want to understand what this whole semiconductor situation is and why there is a race for countries to build it or build plants that can build better semiconductors i highly recommend watching the johnny harris video on this subject other than these two things by far the most interesting part of the interview was the brain drain conversation i was actually surprised to see dr jay shankar being very practical about it uh, especially under prime minister modi he one thing he keeps dinning into us you know think of the world as a global workplace okay this is one like regular message we get from him in every possible way as a global workplace work, global workplace that okay. don't think you know your work opportunities could be anywhere now it's your job in foreign policy to open up those doors okay you know why should a talented indian be restricted why should a talented indian be restricted he's right you know the political discourse for a few years now has centered around how we should keep indian talent within india it's about how we need to create opportunities for smart indians within india so that they stay in india and do smart things in india while sharma ji ka 10th pass beta is preparing to go into iit iim just so that he can get a job in an investment bank in the us of a our politicians are screaming hoarse about how talent is escaping oh my god stop the brain drain but our foreign ministry is actually making it easier for indians to do just that move out we just came out of australia we did a mobility agreement uh, the week before i signed one with austria uh done it with germany uh, with a number of european countries and even with the us your habits change people don't have to leave india anymore to work somewhere the global workplace doesn't mean you shift your place it just means your employer doesn't have to be in the same town or the same country or the service you render doesn't have to be there so that's the kind of world you know we are getting prepared for so you can either feel outrage or you can feel grateful to the government for enabling all of this but the reality is that a lot of upwardly mobile people in india right now are considering moving away to a first world country to continue their upwardly mobile trajectory in life and i repeat the government is helping them do that the best part is dr jay shankar knows that moving to other countries might not be a permanent situation anymore if you define it as you know brain drain there's a country there is abroad why are you leaving uh, you are making it a, a kind of choice which you may not necessarily get the outcomes you want okay i put it to you very differently it's you know the world's like a kind of a membrane you can go in and out and actually that's what's going to happen you know i see i you know i actually encounter a lot of people who do a job go abroad do a job come back go again abroad the days when you said oh if i leave a foreign country and come back to india my you know oh my god maybe i'll never go back again now that's no longer the case so the job is changing the people are changing mobility is changing global economy is changing i think you're going to see a lot of this up and down uh uh you know moment and people will also realize in many industries that actually you may get an opportunity in india which may be better than an opportunity abroad yeah yeah sure i mean sure 7.8 lakh indians gave up their citizenship in 2020 which points towards something permanent but i'm sure there must be some people out there who do wish to come back to india after their stints in the first world they will be really rich here as opposed to the first world countries they are in it's a good thing that the minister is thinking in this fashion and trying to make the latter happen after all 7.5 lakh students are studying in 240 countries worldwide it would be great if they come back after their studies and contribute to some nation building here that's a great thing overall i think this is a good way to look at the problem of emigration it points towards a change of attitude in foreign policy see sensible answers from a smart man after watching this i feel dr jay shankar is the owner of my aap sab ne dekha hoga ki abhi abhi rajya sabha mein maine jo pichle satr ke baad jo videsh niti mein jo uplabdhiyan hui hain jo hamare 
लीडरशिप की जो यात्राएं जो बाहर हुई हैं जो देश में दूसरी दुनिया के राष्ट्रपति प्रधानमंत्री जो आए हैं उसके बारे में मैं अपना स्टेटमेंट दे रहा था सो मोटो स्टेटमेंट दे रहा था और जो हाउस के साम मेरी कोशिश थी कि हाउस को परिचय कराएं कि पिछले महीनों में क्या तरक्की हुई है कहाँ प्रगति हुई है कहाँ देश की जो हित जो है कहाँ कहाँ हम लोग आगे बढ़े तो मुझे बहुत बुरा लगा आज बहुत अफसोस की बात है कि जब ऐसे विषय पे जहाँ पूरे देश का हित जुड़ा हुआ है ये राजनीतिक मामला नहीं है ये देश का हित है ये भारत की विदेश नीति है कोई पार्टी की विदेश नीति है तो जब हम भारत की विदेश नीति के उपलब्धियाँ को आप हाउस के सामने पेश कर रहे तो जो हम वहाँ देखा कि विपक्ष जो है बिल्कुल सुनने के लिए तैयार नहीं थी वो पूरा हो हल्ला हो रहा था और लग रहा था कि उनके उनके मन में था कि कुछ भी सफलता हो आज कल कहीं भी भारत आगे बढ़े उनको या तो उसकी आलोचना करनी चाहिए या कम से कम उसकी जो मैसेजिंग जो है देश को उसको रोकना चाहिए इन राज्यसभा टुडे अंडर द गार्ब ऑफ स्टेटमेंट ऑन फॉरेन पॉलिसी ई एम एस जयशंकर स्पेंट नियरली थर्टी मिनट्स टॉकिंग अबाउट द प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स फॉरन ट्रिप आइटिनरी बट ही डिडेंट रीड आउट द फूड मेन्यूज which was sad how could he overlook such crucial details <sighs> as i record this the opposition is up in arms about the ethnic cleansing happening in manipur there is a literal civil war going on out there the prime minister refuses to attend the parliament and address the issue a no confidence motion has been filed in the lok sabha but don't worry dr jay shankar has been unleashed to talk about the amazing things modi ji did in america geopolitics All right, going deep inside the beer biceps universe is making me have some realizations. I right. keep asking myself, if I was a 21 year old right now, would I be consuming Ranveer's content? Would Ranveer's content shape my 21 year old young world view? I think yes. Because 21 year old me would be the perfect audience for him. Okay, I need to enter third person monologue territory here to tell you a wonderful story. Hello children let me tell you the story of 21 year old man child called Meghnath from Nagpur he sucked at school college sports and everything he touched his parents wanted him to be a chartered accountant but he sucked at that too frustrated he rebelled against his family ran away and came to delhi from nagpur once he arrived meghnath felt small in this big city he was surrounded by ultra smart city people who seemed to know so much more than him were wealthier than him and just seemed to have everything so put together meghnath felt alone he felt like something was wrong with him so he turned to the internet for some support and validation he went on youtube and saw a video on geopolitics where a man called rajiv malhotra was telling the world about how india is supposed to be great because it is supposed to be that way but goddamn white people and their western ways is just not letting it happen only meghnath lonely isolated meghnath needed something to blame for his shitty life someone to lash out at he desperately needed something to feel good about himself so when abhijit told him in the next video that all these elite intellectuals with their eliteness have ruined everything it resonated with him lonely man child begnad who doesn't know any better and hasn't read a single history book in his life agrees with all of this naturally it's not megnad's fault that he is in this shitty place in life it's the elite westerners and their indian counterparts it's george soros it's those feminist type women who hate men like him it's those people who use reservations to get ahead in life while megnad is just left behind rotting in some corner like a discarded banana It's also China's fault by the way. Ranveer's guests are right. There is a yeti in the Himalayas and COVID was the start of World War 3. Geopolitics is so interesting. It makes a youth like Meghnad feel so knowledgeable. 
Now, when he is around those other smart city people, Meghnath can intelligently talk about how a secret Freemasons Illuminati society is ruling the world and calling all the shots. One fine day, Meghnath confidently goes to a party and embeds himself in a group that is talking about the semiconductor crisis. He sees the opportunity and tells people that world trade is actually controlled by this secret society of elite white people and George Soros. Those people laughed. Yes, they laugh at Meghnath for putting forward such ridiculous theories in the middle of a serious policy discussion. Meghnath feels terrible, humiliated and anxious. He leaves the party, cries a little bit and then starts scrolling his feed. Oh, what's this now? New content on Beer Biceps channel? Dr. S. J. Shankar? Who? Oh, right, he's our external affairs minister. Right, right, what a great guy. What a visionary. He's making India look great. He stands up in all these international forums and berates these evil westerners and shows them their place. He shows these elite intellectual types their place. Meghnath feels good about that. Because Meghnath's identity is now suddenly linked to the greatness of India. If India is great, Meghnath is great. And he will not tolerate it when people go against India. Okay? How dare they laugh at him like this? He's knowledgeable, okay? What do these idiots with their fancy degrees from JNU know? AI expert Rajiv and theoretical physicist Abhijit knows so much more about geopolitics than these pretenders who just drink at parties and pretend all the time. Suddenly, lonely man-child Meghna doesn't feel lonely anymore because he has found a community of people online who agree with him and each other. For the first time in his life, he has a tribe. He gets validation from them. Meghnath can now go around the world with his head held high, create an anonymous account on Twitter and troll all these anti-India people who hate people like Jay Shankar and Modi and Ranveer and Rajiv Malhotra. He can join a crowd of other anonymous people and screw with those people who are intellectual, elite, all these JNU types, these tukde tukde gang, you know, all these liberandus and, 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 and you know those people, right? You know those anti-India elements, right? Oh, look, now Meghnath is online all the time. He has completely retreated from the real world. He is a vile troll whose singular job is to defend the greatness of India against these type of Librandu people. What do these idiots know, right? Screw them and their hoity-toity behavior and then tea and muffin chutyap. Oh, look, now Meghnath is creating an app. It is an app to hold pretend auctions of anti-India women journalists. Oh look, now he's live streaming it for the enjoyment of his other man-child tribe. Sweet, sweet revenge. One tight slap to Liberandos. What a wonderful world Meghnad lives in. There is an epidemic of loneliness in India and you, yes you, need to open your eyes and see it. You will know people like imaginary 21 year old man child Meghnad in that story who are, who are currently hunched up over their phones and sending vile messages to someone on Twitter. Beer Biceps is the opening of a rabbit hole towards conservatism, misinformation, conspiracies and fake validation. Ranveer gets his guests which guide young people through the garden of conspiracy theories and made up simplistic thoughts. Once they are happy and feeling great, Ranveer shows them a fence and tells them to plonk themselves on it. Call yourself a centrist. Sit on that fence. You are a centrist now. But that fence is actually in the garden of radical nationalists and fascists. He does it so nicely with his propaganda that the youth, the youth, which he talks so much about, don't even know what the fuck hit them. Between his innocent fist bumps to make things look cool and weird dances with ministers, Ranveer is selling them on a system of thinking. He might claim to his audience that he is just making content because I don't think he knows how to do anything other than that. Make no mistake, 
knowingly or unknowingly flahogandes ranveer is opening up a rabbit hole for many 21 year old meghnads to get radicalized and become a part of a wild troll army which will ruin everything Thank you for watching this video guys uh, this is part 2 of the series as i said there are a few more interviews to go as i said earlier also, also this takes a lot of time to make uh, it this one took me what 3 weeks uh, it it probably 3 weeks because i'm shooting right now i'll edit it and then i don't know how long it will take anyway uh, thank you so much for watching i got an incredible response in the first video that i did uh, th thank you so much for that i was not expecting that uh, and i really think this is an experiment that i'm doing and i hope you are liking it to all the people who are saying make shorter videos no i'm not going to i i'm just going to do this this is what i want to do guys If you want to watch please do. Thanks. Oh and share, like, share, subscribe, all the things. See you next time.